It is Lima time time. Absolutely no idea what episode this is. 139, maybe, maybe 140. That's how professional we are. I am James. He is Pat. Hi. How you been? Terrible. Sweet. Uh, we have a very special <laughs> guest. Uh, someone that that you that, that either you love to love or you love to hate. But regardless, there's love in there. Uh, he is ESPN's national baseball writer, uh, Jeff Passan. And yes, I YouTubed it earlier today to make sure I got the pronunciation right because I've I've been saying Passan for a very long time. Uh, Jeff, how you been? I am great, gentlemen. How are you? Yeah, yeah. you know. All Actually, right. we know how Pat is. Pat's terrible. He just said he was terrible. Yeah. Yeah, things things aren't great. <laughs> Hold on a second. It, it, like Pat, Pat's drinking right now, and yeah. and I have ice. I have ice envy. Do you have a giant cube with your bourbon? I I, I do. I bought one of those uh, those big those big cube ice trays, and um, yeah, and it makes it all all the difference. It looks like it's treating you very well right now, and and I am still in a suit because I'm always in a suit. I go to yeah. bed in a suit. You look very comfortable right now with your drink, and I'm extremely jealous. So I don't think you're doing that bad, to be honest. Drowning a, lot, drowning a lot of misery right now. So let's just, I mean, like, yeah. <laughs> Aesthetically, does it look great? Yes, it does. But down deep below, there's a lot of darkness. So. We'll just, we'll just move up from that. <laughs> do you go do you go like like so you're I can see shirt tie jacket. Do you go shirt tie jacket and like like soccer like basketball shorts or, yeah. or do you have the suit pants to go with it? No, nude. Just straight up <laughs> straight up commando. I yeah. respect it. <laughs> no, I've actually you know what I've actually I've actually thought about doing that just one time to see if I could. But that will be the time when the front leg of the tripod collapses and slowly <laughs> the camera just starts panning down and the glory shots right there and I get fired. So no, I am I am in running I am in running shorts. Never never the full suit. Never the full suit. No. Does that affect the way you feel though? Because I'm kind of like a, you know, looks good, feels good, feels good, performs good type guy. If you're like not in the full suit, do you feel like it's kind of a like a, a, a fake? No, the only thing that matters is what happens when I look straight ahead at the camera and see how I look. And I always feel terrible about that regardless. So <laughs> even though the bottom half is caught up to it, yeah. I like, look, at, look at what I'm dealing with here. Like, there's not a lot going on up top. <laughs> Face for radio, guys. Face for podcasting. That. Okay, so... Um... I, I guess let's let's get to some of the heavier stuff. Then we can we can go a little bit lighthearted. Here so you you became somewhat of a magnet because of reporting on the Mike Fires story uh, from last off season, aka the the bad days. Um, <laughs> but but Pat and I were before you came on, like Pat and I were talking about how negligent it would be to be like I don't you know to to not report on basically the biggest story in, and I and I know Astros fans want to want to say everyone's doing it and I want to get to get to that. And I want to get you on record saying, yes, the Yankees and Dodgers were doing it too. And here's how you have proof. Uh, <laughs> and we can, we can dive into that if you want. Um, but, but what was it like? I mean, when I first saw the story and Pat, you can chime in. It's sort of like a, where it's the, where were you moment? It's sort of up there when like, when the Astros traded for Randy Johnson, uh, you know, it, where were you when this happened? Like, what was, what was your first thought when you saw, what the yeah, when you sort of saw the story and then thought of the implications of what it would entail well let's go back a few years actually because uh i have i have known about what happened well before the story actually came out hmm. and and i don't and i don't say that as like a point of pride or anything it's just i had spoken with people who, not with the detail that Evan Drellick and Ken Rosenthal reported, but the, the general sentiment that the Astros were doing something nefarious, uh, confirmed by multiple people. I don't know if you guys remember this, but uh, during the whole, uh, oh God, I'm blanking, oh, Kyle McLaughlin incident. Mm. Uh, during the postseason, uh, yep. back in 2000s, uh, that was 17, 18, 18, 18, that, that was 18. 18. thank you. God, I, I, I lose track. Yeah, during 2018 postseason, 
Uh, if you guys go back and look at the story I wrote that night, it includes a reference to banging trash cans. Like it was the it was the first reference to trash cans being banged, and I had been told by multiple players that there was that going on. Now the entirety of the scheme. Uh, no, I didn't know that. And I didn't print it beyond what I said because I, I just didn't have enough to go, to go well beyond that. And, uh, I, I, you know, I, I do remember where I was. It was at the GM meetings and I actually had heard the night before the story dropped that the athletic got it. Like it's coming. And that's an, oh shit moment for, for any reporter. You're like, oh God, there's like, I, I don't know that the that the world, that the baseball world recognized what the fallout was going to be. Because when the story dropped, you know, I, uh, I, I write a, a newser up and I just start walking around this resort in Phoenix where, where we're staying for the GM meetings and I'm running into Red Sox people and I'm running into Mets people and I'm asking them, uh, you guys, do you guys ready to get a new manager? And they're like, why? <laughs> and, and, and my response was, uh, cause it's coming. And I like, I, you know, I, I'm not, uh, again, not trying in any way to pat myself on the back here. I just think I had a sense early on of how big this story was, was going to get. And, and I think it ties in a lot to Astros fans feelings about it. Um, very early on, I treated this like it was a big deal. And I think that because those early days, uh, you know, some of the things that uh, Evan and Ken were reporting, some of the things I was reporting were, were just so they, – they were negative. Like they, they painted this organization that fans have grown to love. They've painted this team that is so deeply embedded in the hearts of Astros fans as – being the one that they've been waiting for all these years, it painted them as cheaters. And, and any fan base is going to respond the way that Astros fans did. I don't look at them as, as being lesser than or, or that their response uh, is unfair or ridiculous toward me. I understand why Astros fans don't like me because it, it's very easy to blame the bearer of bad news as being the reason for that bad news. The, the notion, though, that I took any joy in this or, or that I, I liked it is just so patently false. I loved covering the Astros. Like, yeah. that's a good clubhouse. It's a friendly yeah. clubhouse. I enjoyed talking with Alex Bregman, with George Springer, with Carlos Correa, with Justin Verlander, uh, with, with Garrick. You know, all the guys who are there, I really, truly enjoyed conversing with them and talking about their rise and seeing it. And, and so that, that's where I think the, the mistake is, the, this notion that I took any pleasure in this. I didn't take pleasure in it. I just happened to be the person who was assigned to cover the Astros during the cheating scandal, and I had to do my job. And I, I wish that fans could see it that way, but I understand why they don't. Well, it, it's, it's weird because, like, like Drillick and, and Rosenthal, you know, th th there's a number of – because they're with The Athletic and it's a, it's a pay site, like, there's a number of, uh -huh. of fans that don't, you know, that, that don't subscribe to The Athletic because it's just another <laughs> – it's another thing you have to subscribe to. ESPN's different, so for a lot of people, you, yeah. became, you became the face of it, and – and I don't, I mean, I, I, I totally agree with what you said. Like it would be, you just happen to have to, you know, say, here's, here's what happened. Uh, and it, and it wasn't, you know, it's not good news by any means for Astros yeah. fans. Do you, do you think that now obviously not on the same level that the Astros were doing it with the trash cans, but, but how, and that was, that's egregious to, to put it kindly. Um, the Astros fans natural defense and I've, I'm, I'm guilty of this as well as saying that it's, it's more widespread and the Astros mm -hmm. got scapegoated uh, do. And I'm not going to ask you to out out teams, although if you would, that'd be, that'd be freaking. <laughs> uh, but like, 
like was it were there levels of i mean obviously sign stealing has been a thing for a long time but but sure. how 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 widespread i mean we you know there's scott miller wrote a story about how technology is actually you know basically you know saying and, and you you did as well saying like technology is kind of quite pulling the the integrity of the game into question how widespread was it I mean, technology is the Pandora's box that that baseball, I think, if it looks back, almost wishes could go away uh, just because of of how much it changed the sport and how it incentivized teams to do this. And yes, it is 100 percent true. Other teams were using technology to steal signs. I think the best way to put this is that what other teams were doing were misdemeanors and what the Astros did was a felony. They took, they took what everybody else was doing and said, Hey, we're really smart and we're going to do it better because we have done the minor leagues better than everyone because we have done drafting better than everyone because we have done uh, cameras. And I'm serious when I say this, they were the first team to, to use edgertronic cameras widespread and, and those are standard. Uh, the Astros have been ahead of the curve sometimes as much as five years. And, and you can't take away what Jeff Luno did there. Like whatever you think of him personally, whatever you think of him ethically, uh, as a baseball person whose job it was to, to build a team, he did incredible work. Uh, now, would the Astros have won the World Series that year without the sign-stealing scheme? Uh, we'll never be able to answer that yeah, question. But I, do, but I do – here's the thing. I do believe that they would have been, if not as good, then – very close because they still had really talented baseball players who have played well since they weren't stealing signs like that. I, like that, that's the part of this that, that frustrates me honestly the most. This is a, it's a very Barry Bonds type thing. Barry yep. Bonds was a multiple time MVP who did not need to use performance enhancing drugs to be a hall of famer. He chose to though because the allure was just too strong, because winning and, and being the best is really, really hard. And if you can get an advantage to go do it, athletes who are, are motivated by, by one thing, and that is success, are going to chase that success in almost every fashion imaginable. So I, I look at what the Astros did as, as far worse than what the other teams did, because they saw what they were doing, and they upped the ante on it significantly. And, and I, think the, I think passing along signs to second base and having them relayed back home as opposed to batters at home on any, any count in any situation, knowing what's coming, it is a big difference. And, and it's, it's, one that I, it's one that you guys, I think, have acknowledged it's painful it sucks you wish it weren't that way but i think you're honest with yourselves about it and I, I think a lot of fans have a tough time being honest with themselves about it because if they do acknowledge the reality of that if they don't sit here and play what about ism then, then they recognize that yeah the, what the astros were doing was worse what the other teams were doing was not right it was not good but it wasn't at the level of what the Astros were. What are you speechless, James? Are you speechless here? No, I'm, I'm letting I'm letting you have. I've I've dominated this. The, I, well, I yeah, all he's all he's doing I, is talking. I love the to what about ism because that's a, that's exactly what it is. Um, I come from the place which is this is not morally or ethically good. I just don't care. I I don't oh, think. Yeah, so. that's fine. That's fine. You are you are totally well within. Um, I, what is it wrong in the greater scheme of things? One hundred percent. I I will never I will never scapegoat the Astros in that sense. They they were wrong, but I just don't to to be pegged as these as these villains. I, I just I personally, and this is a personal thing that I, I won't put on anybody else. I just 
don't care. They they sold. Some okay, time. so hold on, hold on. That and that's and that is perfect. Pages to them, I, I just didn't seem to matter much in the in the greater scheme of things. Uh, and this is an ethical thing, and it's on me because I'm a terrible person and my soul is completely lost. But it's <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's no. So let's let's turn this around for a second. Uh, the Astros had never won a championship before 2017. You've right. been an Astros fan your whole life, I assume, right? Exactly. Yep. Let, let's let's say that the Dodgers were the ones who had cheated to the level that the Astros did and that the Dodgers were caught and that your championship that you believe the Astros could and should have had was taken away because of a team that was cheating. Are you telling me that you would look at what the Dodgers in that hypothetical scenario did as being, oh, you know, I don't care? Of course not. That's total no, bullshit. So you can – so, Instantly, they'd be scapegoated instantly. I'd be, no. 100%. Of course they would. Of course, no. They would be. That would be the the end all be all. The only reason they lost. No. So I don't fault Yankees and Dodgers fans. Do I think they're a little too whiny? Yes, they're a little too whiny. But uh, too I, I'd I'd be a hundred percent where they are. So uh, yeah, I don't want to be a hypocrite on it. Yeah, a hundred percent. Oh, you're a total hypocrite on it. But that's okay. Yeah. I'm all right with that. <laughs> that's who I am as a person, and I just I can't I can't apologize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, so that, 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 that encapsulates me as a person. But yeah, I'm a huge hypocrite on on everything. But no, so I don't I don't blame them. But uh, yeah, so yeah, you're right. You're right. I am being a giant hypocrite. Correct. No, it's funny because I mean, you know, when when this whole when this when it when things started to to come out and and everyone sort of realized, yeah, this is not good at all. Like it made me think of of every time someone mentions the the St. Louis Cardinals, and I'm like, "Ooh, Cardinals, change your password!" Like, <laughs> I, and I knew that it was going to be that on steroids for the rest of my life. Like that, that, yeah. that no matter what happens, there's always going to be somebody with with nine numbers in their Twitter handle uh, <laughs> and an American flag uh, yeah. right after it, being like, "Oh, bang bang!" And and I just like that's that's the part that and and one of the, one thing that that I don't, I don't think other fans realize that a lot of Astros fans don't care because it was two months after, you know, game seven was, was basically two months after hurricane Harvey. Yeah. And that was, and I, I didn't, I don't live in Houston. I live somewhat. I mean, I could get there. Like if I left at, at breakfast, I could be there by lunch, but like in my, I've got a ton of family still there. Like Pat's there, like I've, a, num a number of people that I grew up with, like lost everything. And then two months yeah. later, here comes this magical world series with Justin Verlander. And, and I, I don't think there's an, I, I think that a lot of crap that Astros fans get is a, a complete dismissal of, of the scandal, but, but also not taking into account the, the perspective of like what was happening in Houston while all of this was going on and not that it's you're not a, a meteorologist and you don't have to write an article saying you know well keep in mind like that they got like 50 something inches of rain you know in in three days and and let's just kind of dial it back a little bit I don't expect other fans to realize that but that's just that's just the reality of of why a lot of people don't care is because you know it was a temporary moment of bliss in an otherwise you know, unimaginable hellscape. Yeah, I, I think that I think that is a totally reasonable perspective. And I don't begrudge Astros fans who sit there and say, this team means a lot to me. And and I want to look at it through the same lens that that Cubs and Cardinals fans look at 1998. I mean, when Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa were doing what they were doing, it right. was incredible to watch. And, and it brought a lot of baseball fans back, honestly. It might have brought the sport back from the precipice that it was on after the strike. And, and we can look back at that and say, yeah, it was when they were juiced up. And, and we can say the same thing about bonds. Incredible things can happen while bad things are happening, too. And yes. you don't need, and, and you don't need to have the fondness of those memories be smirched by the revelation later on that those bad things did happen. You are well capable of acknowledging, yes, there were bad things going on here, but this made me feel good. That is that is human. That is honestly, like in some ways, laudable. And so that's why I, I sit here and say. Astros fans, if if you want to to hate on me, that's 
perfectly <laughs> fine. If if I embody some of this this part of uh, of the Astros, the the revelation of what happened with the Astros, uh, and, and and that is a bad part of this experience for you, then that's that's totally cool. I like. I, I go to sleep very well at night believing that I was fair and that I tried the very best that I could to report as straightforward as possible. Now, there were times certainly where I did editorialize, you know, when Jim Crane talked, I wrote a column on that, right. uh, you know, he during, never during, no, he, no, he never really talked should. again yeah. <laughs> um, during, you know, during, during the Brandon Taubman uh, debacle yeah. in, in October, um, yep. again, I, I like, there are moments where, uh, my job, you know, as somebody who's been covering baseball for upward of 20 years now, I have some perspective. I, I have a sense of, uh, where the sport is in that moment in time and, and to contextualize it is an important thing, but just in terms of, of spreading lies or anything like that, or, or calling, uh, calling out the Astros for things that they didn't do. I, I don't think I did that. And, and I, I, I'd love for somebody to show me where I did. And if I did and, and I see it and I look back on it and I, I realize that wasn't right. I am certainly not above saying that was a mistake. That was an error. I was wrong. Uh, you know, I, I say a lot of words. I write a lot of words. And the idea that I'm going to bat a thousand is foolish because I will not. And and that's, you know, as much as I try to make that the standard, uh, it's just not particularly realistic. Yeah, I think I think, I think that's completely fair. I'd, li I'd like to I'd like to move on away from all of these sad, sad, very, very depressing things. And yes. uh, that will that will haunt my dreams forever to this. <laughs> Well, actually, no, I'm, I'm incorrect because this is also a, a nightmare of a season, d d given, what, given what we're dealing with. So from one terrible dream to another, I'd like to <laughs> maybe a, le a lesser nightmare, a little bit less scary. Um, what, what is your overall impression of the shell that is a season uh, of the 2020? <laughs> just just a, a, your, a, a microcosm. A, a, just what do, you, what, do you, what do you feel about this season? What is this? What is this? Is my question. What is this? Are, are you talking just the season in general or the Astros season? The, the season. Just what is this? What is happening? And yeah, what is this? We don't have to get too I mean, As MLB, the 2020 COVID-19 riddled Major League Baseball season. Um, it's an attempt to put on as much of a baseball season as is possible, and and it embodies uh, two ideas. One, uh, and and probably the primary one inside of the sport, uh, we're bleeding money, and we need yeah. to do something so that we're not. Uh, and two, uh, baseball is better than no baseball. And and I think two is something that has uh, has been recognized and appreciated. By fans, you know, as as weird as the Astros season has been, imagine sitting here right now, as the NBA is in the middle of its postseason, as the NFL and college football are kicking off, as the NHL is barreling toward the Stanley Cup Finals, and baseball is nowhere to be seen. Right. That is what the 2020 baseball season is. It is a, uh, you know, it is a hail mary into relevance. And if baseball were not around right now, uh, I think it would have been absolutely devastating for the sport. And and I'm you know I'm glad that they're playing. Uh, I really am. And it's you know there there are there are sad stories happening all around the world right now, all around America right now. And and I'm not going to say that baseball is is an escape for everyone, but it's like you guys were talking about earlier. Uh, you know when when Harvey hit. And in the city of Houston was was absolutely devastated. Sometimes you need an escape, and if baseball can be that for you, you know, uh, I, I'm I'm happy for you because you get something every night, unless there's a positive COVID case where you take a week <laughs> off and feel right. scared about the the house of cards that is this season collapsing. But otherwise, you get baseball <laughs> every night, and and that is uh, it's just never a bad thing. 
Have you found that that players, uh, just in, in your experience, that that players are approaching it differently, given that you have the you, just the the weird rules, you know, the the seven inning double headers, and just just some of the weird uh, idiosyncrasies that they they've come up with this year. Do you find that the players are taking it less seriously or taking it any differently than any other Major League Baseball season? So there's a there's a rule in journalism: don't ask two questions at the same time because if yeah. you're asking two yes or no questions and one of the answers is yes and the other is no, then the person answering it is totally fucked because they don't <laughs> know what to say. Yeah, I'm not. A um, I'm, I'm dressed like a 19 year old. What do you I mean? What do you want me to do? <laughs> you are you 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 are you are a dentist though, are you not? No. <laughs> no. I'm not. Doctor Patrick Doctor Patrick McClellan, DDS. DDS yeah. is fake. Smoke and mirrors, Jeff. It's smoke and mirrors. <laughs> um, players are taking it extremely seriously, yes. But they look at it, they don't look at it as as this. Eh, I don't remember what your questions were exactly. Okay. God, it was. And I, I, I also don't remember. Basically, I, I'm just trying to ask, like, how, okay, let me, let me, let me just get, let me, let's, let's get this all together. How, okay. how are the players approaching this season? How are they, how are the players viewing this, this abridged, uh, different rules, uh, season of 2020? I'm, I'm not going to say it's like any other year because it's not, but, but the notion that they're not taking it seriously, the notion that they don't care, the notion that, uh, that this season doesn't matter or that the uh, championship is going to have an asterisk attached to it. No, not at all. I, I'll be honest. I think a team that wins the World Series this year is more impressive than teams that have done so in recent years. Uh, they're doing this uh, with restrictions like they've never seen before on their lives. Like the I, Listen, there are millions and millions of people out there who have it far worse than baseball players having to spend their lives in hotels and play a game for a living. But, but I don't want to undersell the, the loneliness that there is in some cases. And, and it's going to be exacerbated in October when they really are stuck inside and are not allowed to go anywhere. That is something that even the strongest people mentally, and I think professional athletes are extremely mentally strong, it's going to tax them. Uh, it, you add an additional round of playoffs with the wild card round. And if you're winning this year, you are defeating four teams. And, and with the playoff fields and the American League as deep as it is and the National League uh, as, as crazy as it is with anyone uh, being able to beat anyone else, uh, except maybe the Dodgers, uh, I, I find this year the crowning of the World Series champion to be every bit as impressive, if not more so, than the recent past. Okay. I, I, yeah, I, I like that. I like that. I, I like that as an approach. I, I I tend to agree, as well. It's just I just think it's just a weird thing to where I, as a player that, I, I could see where players could be upset and and could dismiss it. Like I, I oh heard, totally. Smoltz, Smoltz talking about it last night on 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 the broadcast. Um, just talking about how I, I would not have handled this very well. And 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 I could see where the players to be like, oh, it's sixty games. This is this is bullshit. This is not what I'm used to. And and just kind of brush it all aside. But they're, uh, but they're professionals and they're competitors. So I, at the same time. And and, and here's the thing. I like the idea that this has uh, affected everyone the same. Of course, is is silly. I mean, there are some guys who are having trouble getting up for games. There are some guys who are finding the calmness of quiet stadiums to, to be beneficial. Like it's a really interesting psychological experiment that's going on in baseball right now. And I wish I, I were smart enough to, to find a way to measure it and, and to understand that psychology and see what's going on with players. Uh, I'm not, so I can't, but I think, you know, going, going back after this year, and, and talking with players once they're past this moment and have had some time to reflect on it, it is going to bring up some awfully interesting answers about how it did affect them both positively and negatively. What rules do you think that, I mean, between the seven inning doubleheaders and the, you know, the start of start extra innings with a runner on second, like what do you think sticks for next year? Like what, like what are we seeing now that's going to be permanent whether we like it or not. 
I think the DH is sticking around. I think expanded playoffs are sticking around. My guess is the runner on second and extra inning sticks around. Uh, I don't personally like it. I, I know that it adds action, just the idea of a free base runner in an era when getting base runners uh, to second is, is so difficult. I like it just doesn't sit well with me. Um, seven inning doubleheaders will be interesting because remember, like in a normal year, not a lot of doubleheaders are played anymore. Yeah. So I, I could see that one sticking around too. I mean, it, l- let's put it this way. If they kept everything from this year, it would not surprise me. Like if this is the new normal in baseball, because like, let's remember what the ultimate effect of COVID to me is going to be beyond the, you know, hundreds of thousands, ultimately millions likely of, of lives lost to the virus. To me, what, what the coronavirus has done in America and around the world is accelerate timelines. You look at businesses, you look at industries, you look at plans that were going to be implemented five years down the road. No, that's happening now. You know, in baseball, they were going to, this was the sort of stuff that they normally would just test out in the minor leagues, try for a few years, and then say, oh, yeah, we're going to be doing this now. Uh, not anymore. Uh, th- this, is, this is not just on the field, guys, but in front offices, the, the number of layoffs uh, in the minor leagues, uh, what they're going to be doing in getting rid of teams and the number of player development positions that are going to be, I mean, hundreds upon hundreds of jobs are going to be lost around the sport as it shrinks. And, and this was going to happen. It, you know, the, the scouting apparatus that for years has, has really been the lifeblood of player evaluation and has slowly been chipped away. You know, we've seen the Astros model and, and nobody really had taken the leap to doing it like they did. Uh, a lot of other teams are going to be taking the leap now. And so uh, analytics are going to become that much bigger and that much more important in the grand scheme of the game. All of these things would have taken years before. Uh, now they're just, you know, snap of a finger happening like that. So, <clears throat> no, that, that's really good. Um, what... And, and, and I know uh, it's already been like 10 minutes longer than I, 10 or 15 minutes longer than I said it would be, but you're fun to talk 20. Uh, yeah, 20. <laughs> you're right. Uh, you're right. Um, so I, ha- I have two Fair. questions. I have two questions uh, make sure, left. Make sure they don't they cancel out each other because he will call you out on that. Yeah, no, I, I'm not used to that. I don't like, I don't, and, I, and honestly, I don't like it. Um, <laughs> um, what? what's the biggest question? I mean, you know, last going into the world series, you know, we did a, a world series preview show and, and it was a prediction and, and both Pat and I were like Astros in three. Uh, is that, <laughs> that's possible. Like I, I thought they would handle the nationals fairly easily. What's the biggest question, you know, should the Astros manage to hold off the fight in Jerry DePoto's? Like what's the biggest question facing the Astros in the postseason? I mean, it's got to be starting pitching, right? You know, you got Granky in game one. Who's game two? Probably your Keedy and, and Framber in game three, if it gets to that. I mean, we don't know if McCullers is going to be back at this point or not. Yep. And, and then, of course, is the bullpen, too. You know, beyond Ryan Presley. I know, I know Anoli Paredes has been very good this year. I know there have been other guys who, who have stepped up and been impressive, but – uh, you know, at one point it felt like the, the Astros were carrying an entire bullpen full of rookies. Uh, yeah. are those, are those the guys that you can trust in the postseason? I suppose that we will learn on the fly whether that's the case, but that is a, you know, that's a hairy thing to have to learn on the fly. And I don't think I would have used the word hairy if your <laughs> face were not on the screen right now. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I, I cover up all my awkwardness with hair. It was like, it was like a subliminal thing here. Uh, yeah. I don't have questions. I don't have questions about the lineup. I would love to see Jose Altuve play like Jose Altuve. And, and I hope that he comes off the injured list and uh, is hitting like we know he can hit. But when you have Bregman who's healthy and Correa and Springer and Kyle Tucker finally looking like he's going to become what 
you know, the Astros for a long time have thought he was going to become. Uh, the absence of Jordan Alvarez hurts, but it doesn't hurt nearly as much with Tucker doing what he's doing. Right. Yeah. You have you have a Jose Lima story from from what yeah. I understand. Can you tell I that do. story, please? 2004. Uh, I, I'm 23 years old. And I had gotten hired at the Kansas City Star to be the national baseball writer. And I had gotten hired to be the national baseball writer because I was cheap. I was single. And my boss, who I loved to death but was a huge asshole, knew that he <laughs> could just work me to death. And I, wasn't, I, I didn't have anything better to do. I mean, kind of a loser, honestly. Like... So like social life, look at me. I, I'm I'm not getting not getting married. Uh, so he he's he's like he's like I can I can just take this guy and make him work. So I'm in the Royals clubhouse, and the Royals coming into that season felt pretty good. You know, they had ended 2003 on an upswing. They were hopeful. Tony Pena was like the you know the the next big thing manager, and they sucked. I mean, they were like Astros tank years terrible. You know, I I remember early in the season, Tony Pena to to try and motivate the team, like walked into the the shower in his uniform, like fully clothed, thinking that was going to be the kind of thing that that got them going. Instead, he just had wet clothes. And and that was like a metaphor for, for the year for the Royals. And I, you know, leave time was on that team and uh, he was just, he was such a, such a magnetic force of nature. Like if, if Jose Lima was in the room, you knew it before he even opened his mouth. Like <laughs> he was just this big, bright ray of sunshine. He was like, he was like the box in Pulp Fiction where you don't know what's inside there, but it's just beaming out. He would walk into the clubhouse and uh, and he would just yell, rice and bean for the conos. And he would bring <laughs> rice and beans that his family cooked. <laughs> and and so Lima, Lima, is, Lima is starting a game. It was either a Monday or a Tuesday. And uh, they had an off day. So I had to get him to write the advance story uh before that series and i don't i don't remember exactly I, I he was definitely critical of the team saying like we need to you know we need to turn things around we need to get better everyone in here is responsible i'm paraphrasing but it was something along those lines and and so i wrote that story and i come into the clubhouse uh uh, the next time, I, I don't know if they had gone on the road or if uh, if the game was was that day. But I come into the clubhouse, and next time I see him, he just starts screaming at me. It just like it was the first time a baseball player absolutely lit me up. And this happens to journalists. All, like I, this is one of the things that you know, like we deal with back in the days when clubhouses were actually opened, uh, you know, you need to show up in case someone wants to yell at you. You just, <laughs> that's part of the job. You wear it. It's honestly, it's why when Astros fans say as many bad things as they do about me, that I just kind of like smirk at it. It's like, I've been bitched out by better. And Jose <laughs> Lima, Ho- Jose Lima definitely qualifies he is just lighting me up and the whole team is looking at it and i did i was too young to realize that it was completely performative that even though i had written everything that he had said and it, it, to the point where after this whole dressing down happened i walked up to mike sweeney who's like elder statesman captain of the team nicest guy in the world and i was like mike he said I misquoted him, but I have it on tape right here. Can I play it for you? I was such a little ah. innocent bitch. Uh, and <laughs> and he's like, and he's like, he's like, don't worry, Jeff, don't worry. I believe you. That's just that's just Lima Time doing what Lima Time does. And so that was that was my first experience right there. Jose Lima dressing me down 
in front of the team accusing me of fabricating quotes that I had on a tape recorder <laughs> right there that I would have gladly played for him or anyone else. That's awesome. Pat, you got anything else? No, it's been, it's been, it's been a real treat. It really yeah, has we been. Let, yeah, let, let, let's let you get back to your family. Thank you so much. Uh, we're not going to add on to this. This has been fantastic. So thank you so much for, for taking a, a, a gigantic chunk out of your Sunday evening uh, hanging out. And, uh, we, yeah, we appreciate you. Thanks. Well, I, I need to thank you as well for, for being the – I'm not even going to call it like the sane voice, but like <laughs> – there, you know, I, I say, here's the thing. I say that, uh, you know, jokingly, I've, I've been, you know, I've been yelled at by better. But it, sometimes it does get difficult to, to hear it. And it, when, when you feel like it's totally illogical and inconsistent, and I'm a very, like, I try to be a very logical person. It sometimes does not behoove me well, because this is not a logical world in which we live. But, but you, James, have always been somebody who sat there and actually listened to me bitch over DM, <laughs> mind you. But uh, I, I have appreciated uh, your kind words and uh, your friendship. And uh, this has been a long time coming. And I'm glad we were able to do this. Well, yeah, no, the absolute same on, on my part. And, and, and I hope, I hope the, the DMs can continue. Um, and, I'm actually uh, going to block you right now. Like, no, I've been fair. waiting for this moment just so I can finally end this shit. It's like, been a long time God. coming. Yeah, oh. no, totally deserved. And uh, <laughs> I, won't, I won't begrudge that at all. I, everyone should block me. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying, I've, I've, I've joked that I'm, I'm trying to get back to my original weight of nine pounds, uh, two ounces, and my original <laughs> follower count of zero. Uh, I, so, I, will, I, will, I will say this also. My younger son, who's eight years old, and and who just has a a terrible dirty mind uh, <laughs> was looking over my shoulder and and saw your saw your uh, saw your Twitter account and said, "Does that say thick dong?" <laughs> yes, it, it will. It will for at least the rest of the night for sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so glad. All right. Well, Jeff, thank you so much. Uh, this went way longer. And uh, this is pretty much what I, what I thought it might turn into. I just tried to rope you in with a 20 minute promise. Uh, so, yeah, uh, good work. yeah. So thank you so much. This is, uh, leave it time time. He's Pat. I'm James. That's Jeff. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we'll do it again next week. Not. Yeah, we'll, it'll be, we'll it'll, be it'll, it'll it, next, next, next week is going to be called the bait and switch podcast. I look forward to listening. <laughs>